Joining me today is a commentator and YouTube creator who has been called the king of controversy and someone who, as of this moment, has been suspended by the Twitter, Tommy Sotomayor. Welcome to the Rubin Report. Well, thank you, Dave. All right, I guess we're going to have to do this in over 140 characters because <laughs> uh, you're off the Twitter. Yeah. It's harmful. It's hurtful. It's sad. I don't know if I'll be able to make it till tomorrow, but... <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we are going to do this in long form then. More right. than 140 characters. We'll see if we can do it. So now we're taping this uh, probably about a week before it's going to air, roughly. So there's a chance you're back on Twitter by the time this has happened. We don't know. Uh, what did you do to get kicked off? The king of controversy, what did you do? It must be your fault. Apparently what I did was respond to people who were talking to me or just sent out videos on my own Twitter timeline that the only way you should see it is if you either follow me or someone that follows you retweets it. Now, apparently that's something that makes people really sad about their day and it hurts them <laughs> and they can't have their coffee in the morning and the kids go to school, you know, like uh, Van Jones said, that the kids are at breakfast and don't know what to expect afterwards. Yeah. So they had to get rid of me in order to make those people's lives better. I don't really know. The, the story that I got from Twitter was this. Simply, I was making it a harassing place for other Twitter users which makes no sense because I don't really mess with other people, they mess with me. Yeah, so just to be clear, you're not out there hunting down people and picking fights and all that stuff. You're responding mm -hmm. to people who are going after you. Now, in the most cases, you have more of a following than them, so somehow that then tricks people to think that you're the bully here, but that wouldn't be your take on it. No, and it's like, the biggest thing is YouTube does not protect, not YouTube, but uh, Twitter doesn't protect the content creators, if you do have that type of following, that means that you're generating traffic for them, that every time you say something, people want to see what you say, people want to retweet what you say, they want to watch what you post. But instead, they're allowing the small people, the trolls, to have the most power because you can just poke the bear, then the bear turns around and pulls his claws out, yeah. the zookeeper comes in and shoots it down. Right. So now the bear's like, well, what am I, what am I supposed to do? Right, the bear's going, you let the kid in the cage. <laughs> Yeah. But, but you're a bigger bear, so you should understand. And in life, a lot of what we're doing is saying there's a group of society that's supposed to have more common sense and morality than another group. The other group can just run wild and we must protect them. And I think that's one of the biggest problems we have with social media in America in general. Yeah, so that relates to a lot of the stuff that you do videos about. But before we get to that, for people who have no idea who you are, let's, there might be one or two people out there that don't know you. For those people, who are you? What, what made you get into this game of being public about what you, what you think? I grew up in an atmosphere of where I realized that having a single mom, no man around, was the norm. But as I grew up, I also started to understand a lot of the children from those environments did not do well. They didn't do well in life. They didn't do well in relationships. They didn't do well in parenting. They just didn't do well because they couldn't function because they didn't see the dynamic of two people trying to make something happen. Because if you think about it, in a, in a single parent household, the person who's the single parent is a dictator. If they just don't want you to learn math, you won't learn math. <laughs> One of the greatest movies I love that addresses this is The Water Boy. Mm -hmm. The Water Boy had a single mom who decided to be lord over his life and wouldn't let him learn anything and, and wanted to basically ruin his life. Now, she woke up at the end, but the whole part was, well, we got rid of the father and we don't need the father. And there's too many places out there where people say they don't need the father. So I wanted to address that because father's rights in America are none. Like, no one cares that a father's put in jail for, paying ch for not paying child support, but the woman can have a credit score of 200. So she owes everyone, but she doesn't go to jail for it. But this guy who may have not wanted the child in the first place when the woman gets the option to have the child. I just wanted to address a lot of things on, from a man's standpoint that a lot of people want to address. Yeah, all right, so let's pause on men's right for just a second. Waterboy, would you say that was Adam Sandler's last good movie? Because these last couple have been pretty freaking horrible. They have been. This is a sidebar, but can you admit that? They have been, and the sad part was... <laughs> it is sad. It's watching him because you grew up with him, and he's so funny, and now you're trying to convince people he's still funny, and he's just not... It's like uh, <laughs> the last Metallica album. You really wanted to get behind <laughs> it. 
but you realize it wasn't good. You're just a fan. <laughs> isn't, isn't that, there's something there about like just becoming a victim of your own success, right? Because those first Adam Sandler movies, I mean, to me, Billy Madison is almost a perfect comedy for the time it came out in, and mm -hmm. then a couple after that. But after Waterboy, these Netflix things, whew. Yeah, and then he did the little Nicky. That wasn't funny. Oh. Then oh. Spanglish was his trying to get into That was actually, that was actually okay. good. Yeah, yeah, it's like nobody took him seriously, though, and then that last few things he's done. It's just, it's sad to watch. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Moving past Adam Sandler, we could probably do an hour on just Adam Sandler movies, yes. but, but putting that aside. So when did you actually wake up to that? Because that's a pretty powerful thing. You're saying you came from a household where your mom was, your mom was the dictator, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Were you 12 when you saw what was going on there, or was this later into adulthood? Well, here's a funny thing. It's like, um, I'd say like the movie Frequency, where the guy had two memories. He had one of where his father died, and he had one of where his father was alive because he was the only one that noticed that both happened. Everybody else's life had changed. Well, it's the same thing when you're growing up in a neighborhood where everyone else has a mom, which is a dictator, and it's a norm. When you watch the news right now, or watch the NBA draft, you will see some black guy get up there and he'll say, thanks to my mom, it'll be a bunch of women stand up and there will be no dad. His first thing they'll ask him, what's he gonna do with all his money is, I'm gonna take care of my mom and buy my mom a house. Now you never had to hear Peyton Manning say this because Peyton Manning had this thing called a father. His father bought his mom a house. A lot of black children, the males become the breadwinner. That's why you see so many young men out in the streets selling drugs, because they're trying to take care of and be the man that mom couldn't pick when he or she was had. And it's a sad dynamic. And what happened with me was over time, I started to hang around other people who had their fathers. I got lucky that we went from a bad neighborhood to middle class. And all of my white friends had their fathers. When we graduated, they would have their whole family. The few black people that went to the high school I went to, they all just had their mom, their aunt. And then I noticed that a lot of my white friends went on to be married, a lot of my black friends went on to repeat the cycle. We have children. We're not in the lives of the children. We have multiple mothers. We end up in jail. We end up with criminal records. We end up just not knowing how to survive in society. And I think probably when I was 30, I said, Some, somebody has to say something, because this is ridiculous. Like nobody's pointing it out. But in one side of me, it was saying, but this is normal if you say this. Even my mom said, well, you're saying this and you're trying to make me look bad. And I thought, but it's what happened. I don't understand how we don't want to stop this cycle from repeating itself by having silence. It's the equivalent of having a molester in the house. Nobody wants to say we have a molester in the house because it'll make us look bad to the other people in the, the neighborhood or the community. Mm -hmm. So the molester keeps to go around and uh, keeps, to, uh, keeps going out and um, molesting people and victimizing people. And the victims are the ones who have to be quiet to protect this so-called image that was never there in the first place. Yeah, how difficult is this stuff to talk about? I've done a little bit on men's rights on the show and I've had um, Cassie J who did the Red Pill movie and, and a couple other people, Karen Strawn on. I come from a family, my parents have been married over 40 years and I, do, I don't think until the last few years I realized how actually important that is. When I, now since I, I grew up in New York, I moved away. Now when I go home, and I go home still to the same home that I grew up in, the same community, the friends that they've had for 30, 40 years, kids that I was five years old with that now have kids themselves and all that stuff, that, that, that root has meaning. But it's really hard to talk about this stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Like when people, I, I, you see people bring this up on TV and, and people make it seem like it's about race. And it's not about race, mm -hmm. I don't think, and I suspect you don't think so either. But it, but even for you as a black man, you're black, is that? that yeah, that's that, a rumor. That, that, that is correct, <laughs> it just be a shirt. Um, but, but really, you know what I mean? Like even for you to talk about it, it, it feels like there's a racial component, but you haven't said anything racial really. You're just talking about the, the fact of what you saw. Yeah, and it is difficult to talk about because it affects the black community so much so that when you speak of it, they look at you and they say, well, you're condemning black people. Well, in essence, I am if you pull back the layers because that's the side that I know. Because like you said, your father and mom married 40 years and you've been able to see stability. Well, most of my friends haven't. Most of my friends are like myself. I'm 41 years old. I wake up every day and I'm trying to figure out how to be a man at 41 because I never saw one. I never saw how a man is supposed to be a father. I never saw how a man is supposed to be a husband. I just saw a female dictator and the female dictator could do no wrong. 
One of the biggest problems that I think when you have these women, especially when they're violent, because I grew up in a violent household, the women in our community believe in violence towards their children. That's the way to keep them out of jail, which doesn't work, but it's believed. Uh, there was a woman, a mother in Baltimore, and they called her the riot mom. I don't know if you remember mm -hmm. when her son was out there with a mask on and she came and grabbed him and oh, hit him yeah, upside yeah, the head. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and all the white liberals were talking about how, how great hard. this was. Yeah, yeah. And I said, how is that great? If this had been any parent from any other race, they would have thought that's abuse. First off, why is your child out there? Yeah. That's something you should have known. Number two, the mother was out there with the child. She just happened to see the child. Number three, the woman has six children. She lives in a bad neighborhood, and she has six kids by six different dudes. But nobody wanted to address any of this. She's a good mom, because she's on him. If she was really a good mom, one of the most important things a woman can do is pick the correct person to have the kid with. So we're allowing these women to just have kids with dudes who are in and out of jail, dudes who don't have jobs, but the only person that's being held responsible is the guy. Because, well, you didn't have a job when you had him living in your house and you let him impregnate you. But now that you got fallen out, let's put him on child support, even though he didn't have a job in the first place because you were supporting him. And then that just perpetuates more poverty, more yep. inability to, to get a good job, and you're, you can sort of never get ahead. So if you scale all this stuff back, what do you think is the fault for this? Where did this happen to the black family? Because it, it wasn't always like nope. this. So where, where do you go, how far do you have to go back to start making sense of how it got to this place? Great Society and LBJ, because right before the Great Society and LBJ, black people, as far as couples and families, kids born in wedlock, I think it was 92% in around the early 60s. It dropped in the 70s to around 50%, and now only 24% of black children are born in, in wedlock. The number is astounding. And yeah. you look at right there where they ta started telling black women, well, if you work with the state, if you have children and there's no man there, we'll compensate you. I think one of the craziest things that we have right now is we help families less than we help single moms. So what you're doing if you have a child, say if you have four kids, if you have one who you pay the most attention to because they're getting into dirt and the one that's a straight A student, you decide they know what they're doing. Well, the straight A student will start to become a little jealous because you're not paying them as much attention. So they'll start to degrade mm -hmm. to become closer to that when they get your attention. Imagine if you're doing that with black single moms. They're getting money, they're getting places to stay. I don't know if you saw the black woman who said, I got 15 kids and somebody gonna help me take care of these kids. Oof. And they actually bought her a house a month later because she got on the news yeah. saying, somebody's gonna help me take care of these kids that I laid down and got because I'm a woman and it's my body and I can do what I want to with it. But once I do it, I need help. And that's what bothers me because men don't get a chance to do that. Men don't get a chance to say, it's my body, I can do what I want to, but when I get in trouble, I'm gonna need you to help me out. How much of this is just compounded by white liberal guilt, do you think? Because th this is something I talk about, that, that liberals have gone crazy. I, I would argue it's mostly, it's really progressives and the left, not what true liberals are. Mm -hmm. But that liberal guilt in general just enables this stuff, that because we're so afraid to talk about anything because it will come off as racist or bigoted or any of that stuff, that we just perpetuate this cycle. Mm -hmm. I have Well-meaning people, you know what I mean? I don't think they're bad people. That, that's the most important part. I don't think for the most part they're, they're, there are people, of course, who have bad intentions, but I think for the most part they don't and they're doing something bad. I think the people in power have bad intentions. I yeah. think the people that follow see uh, a magnanimous behavior and it looks like a good thing. And yeah. yes, we, we owe these people. And I started a movement called Guiltless. I wanted white people to stop feeling bad for, because when you look at something like Ebonics, Ebonics was a white person saying, well, they'll never get English. So we'll just say that what they're speaking is a normal language so they can continue to speak it. Meanwhile, you have Jose or Paco, <laughs> whose family just ran across the Rio Grande uh, 10 years ago, yeah. speaking perfect English. There is no reason for us to have the issue if we've been here in America since pretty much the white people were here. We've been here at the same time. So at a certain point in time, you have to view your shortcomings by what haven't you done? Because we can't hold anybody hostage to what they did in the past. You, I don't know one white person who's personally benefited from owning my ancestors who were slaves. I don't know this person. 
Now, if it is, then I'll ask them for the money they owe me. But <laughs> until then, <laughs> if, if, if I'm looking your past. Yeah, no, no, there's, there's, there's <laughs> nothing. You can look. There's nothing. But because of that. Northeast. We're all from the Northeast. <laughs> but because of that, we have to start saying, okay, where are we going to level the playing field now? Everybody just starts here. Yeah. Because that's true equality. But right now, black people, because of liberals, we're not asking for equality. We're just asking for handouts. We're saying we deserve it even though the people who fought, died, and marched for it would not want this. This is not what they were asking for. Dr. Martin Luther King was not asking for a handout. He was just asking for the opportunity to be treated as an equal citizen. Yeah. And right now, that's not what you're getting when you see a fire department have to hire three blacks, even though the three blacks have a lower test score than the other whites because we have to meet a quota. Yeah. And it, in some ways, that then also degrades the services, yep. right? Because if you're allowing people in, whether it's a fire department or a school or a medical school, whatever it might be, if you're letting people in with lower grades because of race, it doesn't have to be just black, whatever the race is, mm -hmm. well, you're actually causing people that are less qualified to be at certain things, and then the, the services, the actual operation you might get. Have you could, been through TSA in Atlanta? Uh, <laughs> one time, actually. Well, I've only been to Atlanta once. I was there, yeah. Well, then you'll see I've been the to JFK. I got you. Well, then you'll see the degradation of service. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true. You go somewhere, and the government, uh, black women make up, I think it's 7% or 6%, 6 to 7% of society. In government, they make up around 10% of the jobs. Why is that? Then they put them in these jobs. We can't get rid of them. And no, most of the time, you go to these places, you're getting horrible service. And, and to... To look at black society right now, that it's a foregone conclusion that all racists believe if you have a black server at a restaurant, you're going to get bad service. Now, that's just a thought that you think of. But you look at other communities. You think of Jews will say, well, my kids are going to grow up to be a doctor or a lawyer. Well, as black people, what we're telling our kids to grow up to be into entertainment, to grow up to be a football player, which is less than 1% of society can do this thing. Mm -hmm. But you're telling your kids the only way out is this way. So what happened to the educated black? What happened to going to school and getting your education? Even at the end of the water boy, you listen to what he said when he was supposed to be going pro. He said, no, 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 I'm going to go and get my degree first. And these are things that are uh, missing in our community because I can't remember the last person who said, your degree matters. When I, got, when I told my mom I was accepted to college, she told me, that's great. I don't know how you're going to pay for it. So for 18 years, hmm. she didn't collect $10 a year, $15 a year, something to send. And that's, my story is the story of the majority of black children. We go to college and it's like, psh, figure it out. If you go, and I've seen black children get discouraged by their parents to not go because they're like, well, I can't help you pay for it. And if you look at what white liberals do, they're continuing to tell these mothers who are producing these children in bad environments, like the black mother in Chicago who had five of her sons, all five of her sons, were murdered in the same neighborhood. They did a whole story about her and they were boo-hooing and saying how horrible it was for her. But wait a minute, she knew she lived in basically Chirac. She knew that was a bad neighborhood. She knew it was dangerous for boys. After the first, Dave, if after the first one of your children got killed in the neighborhood, what would you do? Yeah, you'd get moving. You'd move. Yeah. Yet she stayed there long enough for four more to be, to be killed. And white liberals don't stand up and say, well, that's irresponsible. They'll say, oh, it's because those poor blacks, they don't have any money and we just need to throw more money at them. Well, no, you don't. You need to throw responsibility towards them. You need to say, wait a minute, if you are a woman and you're looking at the world and saying, my body, I can do what I want. Well, once you started having all these kids with all these people who couldn't afford to take care of them, nor could you, we're not going to help either. Why do we not have a system that says, if you have one child and you're on government assistance, you cannot have another one. Why is that considered wrong? No. I mean, I think there's issues related to personal freedoms and all that and what the government gives out, but I, the, the basic idea of what you're saying, I, I get there. I'm, you know, you mentioned something interesting about that what the black community is doing is, is saying, you know, we should win Emmys or, you know, be in entertainment or in sports or that kind of thing. And, you know, there was that whole Oscars so white thing I had on Reva Martin, who was actually for you know diversifying the Oscars more, and then I had Larry Elder, who I suspect you probably agree with a lot more, saying how ridiculous it was. But to me, it's like just ha winning more Oscars or more Emmys or having more people in sports has nothing to do with the success. There's a reason why Chinese Americans 
and Indian Americans, meaning people from India, not Native Americans, they don't care about that stuff and they don't protest it because they are busting their asses in school and that has to come from the home. And th so their eyes, basically their eyes are on the right prize, not the prize that the liberals want you to think is the right prize. If only we had the exact amount of people winning Oscars, everything <laughs> would be equal. But this is, a, this is a really hard thing to extricate from which, society. Which doesn't make sense because if the same amount of people who are black were winning awards just like white people, white people should complain because white people have more people in the United States, so the numbers wouldn't bear it out. Why well, would only third, white people should complain about the NBA. I'd get tired Trust of being me, a I white guy. I wanted to be in the NBA. Right, I'd get tired of being a white guy turned on this television with my two white sons <laughs> and we're watching all these black guys run up and down and my kids thinking, well, I can't be that. Yeah. How fair is that? Now, had this been the NBA and it been a bunch of white people, black people would have said, well, they're keeping black people out because they just don't want us in there. Yeah. But when we're overrunning it, we're like, yeah, that's because we're better than you. Yeah. <laughs> If we won all the Oscars, there would be no black people saying, well, that's kind of messed up that no white people won when we'd be like, yeah, because we're better than you. <laughs> Trust me, my hero is right there. <laughs> Clyde Drexler, 80s, 90s basketball star. I wanted to be him. I realized the skill set was not there <laughs> to go ahead and be Clyde.